Welcome, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Victoria Herman. I am the principal investigator of the Migration in Harmony Research Coordination Network funded by the National Science Foundation at Georgetown University. I'm also a senior fellow at the Arctic Institute, and I am so honored to have you joining us today for the Working at the One Health Interface in the North American Arctic webinar. We have four awe-inspiring speakers today that I will hand over my virtual mic to shortly so that together we can learn about the role of migratory wildlife and the transmission of zoonotic parasites and vector-borne diseases in the Arctic. We will be recording this webinar, so if you have to go, not to worry, you will be sent a link in your inbox later today. We will also have a question and answer session after our presentation. So if you have questions for any of our four speakers, please type them in the chat box as they are speaking, and I will moderate the Q&A afterwards. If you have any technical difficulties as the presentation is going on, please feel free to also put that in the chat box or direct message me so that I can make sure to support you best. All right, that is enough from me. I am going to hand over my virtual mic to our first presenter, the amazing Dr. Emily Jenkins, who is a professor at the Department of Veterinary Microbiology in the Western College of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Saskatchewan. Over to you, Emily. Thank you so much, Victoria. It's, it's such a privilege to be here. Um, I am going to be bracketing either end of presentations by some of my senior or very recently graduated students. Um, and I am going to highlight the work of a broader network. Um, this is actually um, a Canadian Arctic One Health Network is a research-based network it is focusing at that One Health interface and the things that kind of broke down into different pillars of our, our network uh, were food and water safety and security, people, dogs, and wildlife, looking at the interactions there, Arctic fox and rabies models, vectors and vector-borne diseases. And each of these pillars has been led um, often jointly by multiple members of our network. There are PIs at various academic institutions. And then at the end, we're going to introduce you to a very crowded acknowledgement slide showing the vast number of people on the ground um, and from a variety of backgrounds that are really critical to making this work happen. And of course, um, I don't think One Health needs as much of an introduction as it used to. I think after surviving uh, the emergence of a zoonotic virus in real time, we're all pretty aware of the drivers of emerging infectious diseases at, at the animal-human interface. But One Health is in essentially an approach. It's the connecting piece that recognizes that the health um, of the world cannot be compartmentalized, that it requires looking at the interfaces between domestic animals, wildlife, people, and most critically, the environment that allows us to raise the bar on health for all. And that there's there's no cheating. You cannot raise the bar on, on health in one area and um, compensate by losing it in another. So it's a very interdisciplinary, even transdisciplinary approach that goes beyond our usual silos. And that requires taking a, a step back and looking at things from a different perspective. It doesn't mean that a single researcher or even a network of researchers like ours can do all of these pieces. So the pieces I'm going to focus on today are looking more at that wildlife, uh, environmental, and human health interface, looking at zoonoses and vector-borne diseases. I do want to put a caveat in here that we know that One Health is more than just looking at risks. It's not a completely threat-based assessment. It's also recognizing the tremendous benefits that we have at these interfaces, um, and particularly in the North and particularly 
indigenous cultures have long recognized One Health. It's a completely intuitive concept. It's nothing new for them to recognize that the health of all these things are related, that sustainable wildlife populations are very intrinsically linked to human health and that we're all experiencing common risk factors through the environment. However, the environment is changing and no more so than in the Canadian North. These are, this is based on recorded data. So this is not modeling projections. This is observed data since we basically started putting out weather stations in a systematic fashion in, the 19, in 1948. And so we can see that climate warming is a trend across Canada. Our national trend is approaching two degrees Celsius, but it's not equitably distributed that there are hotspots. And indeed the Canadian Western Arctic is one of those hotspots. Um, with uh, almost three degrees Celsius warming already observed in the last 70 years of monitoring. Um, that's why it's a little disheartening to hear things like um, the goals of the earth, <laughs> the global leaders of earth are to have warming set to a 1.5 degrees Celsius global warming by 2030. The Canada, Canada and the Canadian Arctic in particular are already experiencing life uh, well after 1.5 degrees Celsius warming. So we have the dubious distinction perhaps of being a bit of a canary in the global coal mine for, for global warming. But it is also important to recognize that there are huge benefits to having intact and sustainable wildlife populations. And when we look at the UN Sustainable Development Working Goals for the world, we can see that wildlife has a role to play in many of these goals. And I put a black box around the ones where wildlife in the North contribute to sustainability, um, addressing poverty, addressing hunger, addressing health, addressing education, jobs, sustainable cities and communities, um, protecting the planet and conserving water, life below water and life above water. Um, as well as peace and justice, sustaining Indigenous rights to harvest healthy and safe wildlife populations. So it's not probably a surprise that One Health falls under the Sustainable Development Working Group of Arctic Council, but of course it also has, being interdisciplinary and by its own nature, um, it is tied to things like human health through AMAP, uh, through the biodiversity and conservation pieces of the Arctic Council as well. So really, and I couldn't say it better than um, in the words of some of our Indigenous colleagues, wildlife health is human health in the Arctic. There is no line between the two. Um, it is a key part of food security. Food security remains a tremendous problem in the Canadian North. Um, in Nunavut, 70% of households experience some kind of food insecurity, and that is related to things simply logistical things of getting getting food into the north. Um, if the plane doesn't come in, the shelves can look like the picture on your left. And that's when the shelves in the community freezer need to look like the picture on the right so that people have, have locally harvested healthy foods to, to access. So wildlife are a huge component of contributing to food security, but there are concerns expressed by our Indigenous communities about changing access to hunting grounds with climate change, losing the ice, losing our platforms to access wildlife, uh, changes in the wildlife stocks themselves, whether they're declining or they're moving elsewhere, the net outcome is they're less accessible for harvest, and then concerns about environmental contaminants and poor wildlife health. And some of the examples on that on the infectious disease side um, are here from recent headlines. We have a really strong signal right now and concern about something like avian influenza, which is showing up in our migratory birds that are heading north for their breeding grounds in the summer. Particularly important this time of year because goose harvest is, um, <laughs> sorry, I'm having help from my polar cat. Uh, <laughs> so goose harvest is very important in May. Every year it's a pretty, goose week is very exciting. Um, but this year is a little tainted by concerns over the health of the birds uh, themselves and what that might pose for people. Um, some of the parasites that we work on are foodborne parasites, uh, such as Toxoplasma gondii, which you're going to be hearing a lot about, or the roundworm trichinella, which has long been recognized as a cause of outbreaks of human disease in the Canadian Arctic and elsewhere where people rely on, on consuming wildlife. 
Uh, rabies remains a challenge, and we've had a massive outbreak in the last year um, of Arctic fox rabies, which had implications for safety and human health in the north. Um, but looking at, at another aspect of our network, uh, based out of Université de Montréal, is looking at modeling what climate change might mean for the connectivity of Arctic fox and Arctic fox rabies around the circumpolar north. And then we know that climate change is going to change the patterns of food and waterborne disease, but it is most importantly going to impact the emergence um, and changes in transmission of endemic vector-borne diseases. So there's a real interest in looking at what do we have now? What are our, even our baselines? Most people don't think of the Arctic as a hotbed of vector-borne diseases, but you may have a different perspective at the end of this talk. So it is my great privilege to introduce to you uh, two recent graduates, uh, Dr. Dr. Emilie Bouchard, who is currently um, based in Quebec, Dr. Kayla Bueller, who is coming to us today from Norway, and Dr. Adrienne, about to defend, Hernandez Ortiz, who is currently based in Saskatoon. Um, they're going to give you a little insights into the, some, some aspects of their PhD work. And then we'll circle around to discuss the broader picture of how this kind of work comes to pass and what it what some of the the um, overarching mechanisms or conclusions we can draw from it. So I will now hand oh well I guess we can yeah we'll hand off to Emily, who will start in by telling us a little bit about a very little parasite that's a very big problem in the Canadian Arctic, Toxoplasma gondii. Okay, thank you, Emily. Uh, I hope you can all see my screen. Um, so hi, I'm Emily Bouchard. <clears throat> I uh, recently defended my PhD and I'm now working as a wildlife health specialist for Environment and Climate Change Canada. Um, and as Emily said, I'm in Quebec right now in Eastern Canada. Um, and most of my work for my PhD was done uh, on the, the Inuit Nunangat, so the homeland of the Inuit in Northern Canada. So today I'm going to present on one aspect of my research uh, from land to sea and back again. Foxes who consume more marine and migratory prey have higher exposure to the terrestrial parasite pollutant Toxoplasma gondii. So first I'll just going to explain uh, a little bit on Toxoplasma. So um, Toxoplasma is a one-cell obligate intracellular parasite, meaning that it can only grow and replicate within host cells. Um, and it can infect pretty much all uh, warm-blooded vertebrates, and it has a worldwide distribution. And it has been um, estimated that about a third of the world human population has been exposed to it. So it's a significant uh, zoonotic and veterinary, veterinary pathogen. Uh, but despite the very high prevalence, uh, the parasite, when infected, um, the host will develop immunity against reinfection. So the parasite remains harmless most of the time. Uh, but if you're immunosuppressed, uh, it can cause neurological, ocular, and uh, reproductive problems, especially um, to uh, the fetus. So the life cycle can be divided into three infective stages. Uh, first, we have uh, what we call sporozoites, which is the environmentally robust uh, stage. Uh, so spor spor sorry, sporozoites are protected inside an oocyst. Um, so, and it is the result of the sexual reproduction of the parasite that can only uh, occurs within the intestine of the definitive host, which are the Felidae family. Uh, we then have tachyzoites, which are the rapidly dividing form that will uh, be found in the blood immediately after infection. And then we have bradyzoites that will form tissue cysts in muscle and organs uh, and persist in this tissue. Um, we can divide the life cycle into components then. So as I said, the sexual components that only occurs in phyllids, the definitive host, and an asexual component that can occur in all warm-blooded animal that we call intermediate host. And just to quickly explain the life cycle, um, so we have our feline phyllids that get infected, 
it will, it will shed oocysts in the environment that will become infectious after a few days under ideal conditions, and then will infect other hosts. Um, and once these hosts are infected, these oocysts will convert into uh, tachyzoite uh, that, with, that will rapidly expand the parasite population uh, within the host. And with the pressure from the host immune system, the tachyzoite will convert into bradyzoite and form tissue cyst. Um, that uh, will persist in muscle and organs and then can initiate a new infection when ingested by carnivores. So the parasite can perpetuate asexually in this manner. Um, knowing that, we then have three main ways of transmission through the environment by uh, drinking contaminated water, eating contaminated food with oocyst, through carnivorism by eating meat, harboring tissue cysts, or vertical transmission, uh, the mother to uh, the fetus. So uh, actually, this, this parasite disproportionately affects public health in some northern uh, of uh, some regions of northern Canada, especially um, in Nunavik in northern Quebec, uh, where we have a human exposure of around forty three percent, and Nunavut, which uh, with a human exposure exposure of around thirty two percent, which is quite high compared to the North American American average of fifteen uh, percent. And wildlife can also be affected with uh, transmission uh, that may be altered by the rapid demographic and environmental changes affecting the Canadian North. So, um, as I said, tig on die sexually reproduce in feline intestine, but felines are quite absent above the tree line. There's not many. So the transmission there still remain a little bit enigmatic. Um, the main hypothesis is that migratory animals, such as caribou or arching nesting geese, they get infected uh, when they seasonally migrate south. Uh, and then they will then develop tissue cysts in muscle and organ and go back up north. So uh, foodborne transmission is likely a significant way of transmission among northern residents. Uh, especially due to preferences for raw, fermented, or dried meat. And the same scenario will apply to Arctic carnivores, such as foxes. Um, so by knowing the exposure and the prevalence of this parasite in different regions, it will help us understand better um, yeah, the distribution of this parasite in particular regions. So this is uh, the main region I've been working on for this uh, project. Um, in Nunavik in northern Quebec. So uh, with the help of uh, hunters and trappers that um, trap foxes for the fur, uh, we collected carcasses uh, from these animals, so red fox and arctic foxes, mainly from uh, Hudson Bay, western Nunavik, and Ongava Bay, eastern Nunavik. So in these foxes, I tested the brain and heart since these two organs are sites of predilection for the parasite to detect DNA, so sign of infection. And then I look into heart fluid to detect antibodies, uh, so sign of exposure uh, of this parasite. And what I found is that for um, exposure, we can see there's a quite a high uh, prevalent in Hudson Bay compared to on Gava Bay, and the same occur with uh, detection of DNA, again with 51% Hudson Bay, 20% in on Gava Bay. And when we compare with seroprevalence in humans from a recent Inuit Health Survey, we also see this big difference. So um, it's quite a bit higher in Hudson Bay, 56, compared to on Gava Bay, 37. And according to the nutrition and food consumption among the Inuit of Nunavik survey, um, the consumption frequency of marine mammal, birds, and fish um, is higher in Hudson Bay compared to Ongava Bay, where land animals were most frequently consumed. So this brought the question of how these foxes get infected, um, whether it is through marine force sources, uh, migratory force sources, sources such as geese, um, we know that from previous work, these uh, DNA of Toxoplasma um, uh, has been detected in geese from Nunavik, um, or whether it is through terrestrial herbivores such as lemming. And in order to answer that question, I decided to look into stable isotopes. Um, so stable isotope allow me to reconstitute the diet of foxes, and then um, I would then be able to link prey with the status of infection. And the two most commonly used uh, isotopes in traffic ecology are nitrogen and carbon. Um, so in uh, the y-axis here, 
um, the ratio of the nitrogen will tell me the degree of carnivorism of an uh, individual. And on the x-axis, the carbon will allow me to distinguish between marine food sources and terrestrial food sources. So different food items um, of the fox will have different stable isotope ratios, and then it can be traced back um, in the tissue of these foxes. So a uh, different sample type uh, will give me different window in time on what the fox ate um, because of the isotopic turnover rates of these um, different type of samples. So for example, for a fox trap in February, um, I uh, decided to look at muscle and hair since I had these samples and it will allow me to distinguish between their winter diet and their uh, and a summer fall diet. So muscle sample will give me information through two to three months back when a fox was trapped. So the turnover rate is about two to three months. Uh, so winter diet and hair will give me information since the last molt of the animal. So um, August through November. So more end of summer, fall diet. So basically, uh, I already had the signature of the prey from this region with uh, the help of collaborators. And now that I was able to get the isotopic signature of the foxes by testing the muscle and hair, I was then able to estimate the proportion of different food items in their diet. Uh, and to do that, I used a mixing model technique. Uh, and this is what um, the model will give me uh, this is only when I put the prey in the model. So I decided that to look at three main preys of the foxes to distinguish between terrestrial, migratory, and uh, marine food sources. So uh, lemming, geese, and fish. And fish will represent all marine food sources since they have very similar isotopic ratios. Um, so when I put uh, the result from my foxes, this is what I get. So uh, in yellow, we have all the infective foxes with toxoplasma. And in blue, we have the negative fox. And when I put them in the model, what I can see for the winter diet is that the infected foxes, um, we can see there's a tendency to go toward geese and marine preys. And the same scenario happens for end of summer and fall diet. Um, with the infected foxes uh, consuming more geese and marine preys. And so uh, for, for both period, the infected foxes had a significantly higher input of um, ratios of carbon and nitrogen, meaning that they were more likely to consume migratory and marine prey compared to uh, negative fox. Um, and overall, this, uh, this, these findings support the hypothesis that marine and migratory food sources can be an important route uh, of transmission of toxoplasma in northern regions. Um, and just to conclude, uh, this research definitely shed new lights on the current status of this parasite in uh, Nunavik, helping identify where are the high-risk region um, for infection. Also to better understand the trophic relationship of foxes and their prey species, and uh, more importantly, inform future risk assessment and predictive models to determine the potential human and animal health risk associated to this infection. Um, so yeah, that's it for my presentation. So I'll hand it over to my colleague. <laughs> Hello, um, um, I am Adrian Hernandez. I am a current PhD candidate at the University of Saskatchewan uh, that is located on 36th territory and homeland of the Métis. And what I'm going to present today is part of my PhD research. In this case, we were looking for Toxoplasma gondii, the same parasite that Emily uh, explained before. Uh, in harvested caribou from Nunavik, Canada, that is the Inuit, the homeland of the Inuit. Uh, to start, I want to give you some numbers about what is the situation of uh, toxoplasma in the world. So it is considered that it's the fourth most important parasite around the world, according to the WHO in 2014. 
It's also ranked as a sec the second out of 14 food board pathogens in the USA and the first one in Netherlands. And the midborne transmission is considered that accounts to 60% of all toxoplasma uh, infections in, in human population, according to the European Food Safety Authority. And also is uh, considered that sheep and pork are the major source of infection to humans, just talking about livestock. In the situation in the Canadian Arctic, Toxoplasma is considered the most parasitic infection in Inuit communities, and more specific in Nunavik, according to the um, health survey that was in 2017, the zero prevalence in, in this region was 42%. And I'm going to talk to you, talk to you a little bit about the country foods, as Amy Lee explained you. Um, some of the ways that the food is, is consumed in general in all the world, that if, if it's raw or fermented or dry, that is not totally cooked, that can be a way of transmission of parasites. However, is the country foods in the Arctic are, are essential, are part of, of, the, uh, of, of the culture of the communities are because they share the food and there's a way that they have been doing it by many generations as well and it's very important it's part of the food security and is uh, for them and it's, if you consider that these communities are as in remote areas and the products that we have in a normal grocery stores have higher prices also because of the transportation so this food is the country foods are important for for them uh, here I'm showing you a graphic that was from uh, a shake report in 2011. They are just comparing the percent of consuming of different country foods and the difference between two years. But I want to focus in the caribou that is ranking in, in the fourth, uh, in the first, in the, it's ranking in the top five, sorry, <laughs> uh, country foods that are consumed by Inuit. And it will depend according to the community. These are, are country foods, but caribou is considered the most important one. So that's why uh, we focus in caribou, uh, thinking that it could be a way of transmission of the parasite. Um, and more specific, we were looking for the leaf river caribou hair. In this map, it's the Que Quebec, is the map of Quebec. And this part is here is Nunavik. So the Leaf River hair lives in this area here. The Leaf River caribou is considered a migratory ecotype and has been reported long-term fluctuations in population during that time. Uh, and well, as I mentioned in this map, we are looking to different herds in Quebec, but the one that we are focusing is the Leaf River and is the one that is harvested by uh, Nunavik communities. So we were working together with the communities and well, the way that we did it is we were creating sample kits containing plastic bags labeled with the organ that, or sample that we needed from them and some other material that we have helped them like uh, in the sampling like gloves or cards to identify the animal, the sex and the age of the animal as well as the name of the hunter and the date of, of, of the harvest. Uh, we are uh, working with collaboration with the Nunavik Hunting Fish and Trapping Association and the Nunavik Research Center that are located in Kujuwake. And from here, the sample, the sample kits were sent to the communities to Tasiujak and Umiujak, that are the ones that here. And, uh, so basically, we sent the sample kits and the hunters just took the samples that we needed and sent it back to us. So we were asking for heart tissue and brain tissue from the caribou uh, for this project in particular. And uh, as the same way as Emily, we recovered the heart fluid from the heart when we were throwing uh, the heart tissue. 
And we were looking here for antibodies and, and we were running the samples by an ELISA. So we were looking for antibodies to tell us if the animal was uh, exposed to the parasite or not. Then the, the tissue and, uh, from heart and brain, we were looking for the DNA of the parasite. And we were using a, a specific technique for toxoplasma gondii that uh, is using up to 100 grams of tissue. And what we're looking is uh, more chances to get DNA of this parasite in, in, in the samples. So when we got uh, by serology, uh, we had difference between the, two, the samples from two, the two communities. From Tassio Jack, we got 27% from 55 uh, animals. And in Numio Jack, 3% from 33. This difference we were wondering about, and if you remember the results from Emily and also from the uh, Nunavik Health survey, the prevalences are inverted, so are, are in the other direction. However, these, these results are from the same caribou population. And some of the uh, ways to explain the difference is could be just the timeline, so the uh, time that the, the animals were harvested, as well just the sample size, because we get less uh, samples from Omiuja. And uh, from the 88 animals that we got, uh, samples did, on, did not amplify DNA for toxoplasma, so they, neither for brain and heart. So with the discussion is that, that we got antibodies for T. Uh, in heart fluid in 18% of the all harvested caribou from this study that actually is lower than the zero prevalence reported by Nick Bashan, that was also a member of our lab. He reported 26% in the same area of in Caribou, uh, but the results are, are actually higher than the overall zero prevalence in migratory Caribou across Canada, that is 2%, and 1% was in live, just in the Leap River uh, here. Um, this difference could be related also with the timeline of the study, but also the type of the tests that they were using and the samples. We have found discrepancies between serology and molecular results for Tigonia in wildlife samples, including caribou, and has been reported before, as I mentioned, Nick Bashan, and also some of the studies of Amy Lee, um, and specifically with Nick he report uh, this zero prevalence of 26 in the caribou, and he didn't find DNA as, as in our case. Just to conclude and put it all together within, um, we, uh, with both projects of the Nunavik Health Survey and the isotopsin foxes, that in both report a correlation between exposure of T. and the consumption of marine animals and migratory birds. And our findings show the low exposure for T. in caribou samples. So the, if we link all together, the, the information has been supported. So the, probably the uh, communities in, in Nunavik, they are getting the, the, the exposure to the parasite, but these marine and migratory birds, but not the caribou. So therefore we can say that the risk of foodborne transmission from caribou to humans is low. And yeah, that's it from my part. And I will give it a, a step to Kayla. All right. Let's see if we can get this going. Okay, so thanks, Adrian. Um, so my name is Kayla. I am a postdoc at the Inland Norway University of Applied Sciences right now, but obviously we're talking about North America. So most of my work was done on Inuit land, and I'm really going to be talking a lot about the majority of the Canadian Arctic. And I have uh, the privilege of introducing vector-borne diseases into the equation now. So just like Emily said. 
Uh, Vector-borne diseases. Let's see if my slide will move. There we go. Okay. So, yeah, Emily introduced this fact that the warming that we're seeing in the Canadian Arctic is very much uh, highly concentrated in the western part of the Canadian Arctic. So you can see that on this map right here. Uh, so we see the Yukon and Northwest Territories and part of Nunavut as well being affected a lot. And then also another factor to keep in mind is that precipitation is also impacted. So the other map, the blue map, shows us that the largest increase in precipitation is occurring in the central part of the Canadian Arctic. And that obviously is going to impact many things, but it is going to impact significantly infectious diseases and zoonotic diseases that can be transmitted between animals and people. And I like to focus on vector-borne diseases. And I think that these, this specific type of transmission is probably going to be impacted. It's one of the, the methods of transmission that's going to be impacted the most by climate. And that's because insects are so highly sensitive to temperature and precipitation. And so we're not going to do any math at all right now, but this is what an R0 looks like. Many of you have probably heard of the R0 before for probably from movies, outbreak movies like Contagion, or even because of the pandemic that just happened. The r naught is a fancy way of measuring how, how well something is transmitted, how quickly something's transmitted. So basically from one infected host, how many more infected uh, animals are we going to get or people are we going to get from that one infected host? So this r naught is the basic r naught for vector-borne diseases. It's from a malaria model, so not necessarily completely applicable to the Arctic, but it has a lot of good little things that show us just how much climate is going to impact transmission of these different vector-borne pathogens. So one thing that we do see changing is the ratio of mosquitoes to hosts. So for example, with an increase in temperature, we might see the environment becoming more suitable for other species of mosquitoes to move further north, right? Mosquitoes that don't do well necessarily in super cold temperatures. So we might see different species moving further north. We also see an increase in the density of the species that are already present in the north. We also know that the biting rate is impacted. So how frequently they're going after hosts and how aggressively they go after hosts with even one or two degrees increase. You can see them seeking out hosts more vigorously, so the biting rate might increase. We also know that mosquito survival is impacted by climate. So with an increase in temperature, for some species, you might see that their development quickens almost. So from larva to adult, they develop much more quickly and therefore they survive better. And then also we know that another factor is how well or how quickly they move a pathogen through their own body, right? So the amount of time that it takes for a mosquito to become infective, for a virus, for example, to move from the blood meal through the body of the mosquito into the salivary glands so that when it bites another animal, it can transmit that virus. And that can shorten that time span along with an increase in temperature. So obviously all of these factors impact vector-borne transmission and we're gonna see a lot of that impacted in the Arctic. So I'm gonna focus on one specific group of viruses called California serogroup viruses. Some of you might actually have already seen some of this stuff at the recent Tarandus meeting um, for Scandinavia, but it is very interesting stuff. The California serogroup viruses, you may never have heard of before, but they are very common. It's a group of viruses that are one of the leading causes of arboviral associated encephalitis in North America. And for the vast majority of us, we would never know that we ever had one of these viruses. You might feel sick for a day or two, and then you would recover. So you wouldn't know at all. For the unlucky few, some of these viruses can move into the central nervous system and up towards the brain and cause encephalitis. Now, for the hosts that are involved, the wildlife hosts, there's some variety depending on what virus you're looking at in the serogroup. 
but we're going to focus a lot on Jamestown Canyon virus, which is one of these viruses because they're they're usually associated with white-tailed deer as the reservoir in the southern parts of the United States. So that's kind of what we know. Now we know that the, this group of viruses are present in Arctic regions because in Alaska, they've done a zero survey of humans and quite a high number of people did test positive for antibodies. So it clearly is present in the North. We also know that the mosquito species that are required for transmission are present as well. Almost all of the species of mosquitoes that we've collected are Aedes species. And then one of the big questions is whether or not there's wildlife that are capable of maintaining these viruses in the wild. And so the big question, of course, is because we've got this cervid caribou that are very prevalent in the Arctic regions, a big question is whether or not they could be a potential reservoir for these viruses. So we actually set out to do a very large survey across all of Canada, including some, I don't know, more southern regions, not necessarily Arctic. But we looked at polar bears, at caribou, at Arctic fox and red fox. And I'm just going to focus on polar bears and caribou for the purpose of this presentation, because there's a really interesting story that they give. Um, but so we looked at for polar bears, you can see 28% of them tested positive, And we'll talk about that right away. They're all from the Western Hudson Bay region. So the Hudson Bay population. And then for the caribou, they were actually very well dispersed across all of Canada, including Yukon, Northern BC, Northwest Territories, Nunavut, uh, Nunavik. So we're going to start out with polar bears because obviously everyone gets very excited with polar bears. So we had the opportunity to work um, on a very nice uh, historical, I guess, archived group of samples. And we were able to look at the 80s, at the 90s, and from 2015 to 2017, we tested blood to look for antibodies for the, this group of viruses. A lot of these viruses cross react because they're so closely related. So you you usually start with a screening test to just look for in general these these viruses, whether or not animals have been exposed or people have been exposed. So the interesting finding here when we look at the time periods is that in the 90s, we see the highest exposure. And when we look at what was happening in the Western Hudson Bay during that time, we see the largest amount of sea ice loss. And so then when we looked at different climate variables and compared it to exposure, we did find that uh, the factor that was significantly associated with exposure was summer air temperatures. So it makes a lot of sense. We have higher summer air temperatures that leads to less sea ice. And what happens when you have less sea ice? the bears are forced onto land for longer and longer periods of time. And while they're on land, they're going to come into contact with the things that are on land. And one of those things are insects. So it makes a lot of sense what we were seeing in the 90s. Now, the thing that was also really interesting is that we looked at biological factors and we found that the one thing that was statistically significant was actually sex. So if you look at the prevalence in females versus males, we do see that females are two times, if not more, likely to be exposed than males. And when you understand polar bear behavior, it makes a lot of sense again. So when males move on land, they tend to prefer coastlines. And with coastlines, you have high wind speeds that keeps the insects down. But the females, for some reason, they like to move further inland so they they prefer peatland and boggy areas moisture rich areas and of course that's prime mosquito territory right because what do mosquitoes need for breeding stagnant water so it's a really interesting thing that we found with this association with sex and it brings up a couple of big questions the first thing what does this mean for bears that are facing a future of climate change? Well, it probably means that as they're forced more and more off the ice and onto land, 
they're going to be exposed to certain things that they might be naive to or that they haven't been exposed to a lot before. So increased exposure in both sexes is probably expected with warmer temperatures for not necessarily just California serogroup viruses, but it might apply to a variety of vector-borne pathogens. The other question is because of this association with higher uh, exposure in females, could we see some effects on reproductive success, on pregnancy for different pathogens? And so these are all big questions that future research probably will address. So the next animal we'll focus in on are caribou. And these guys were very interesting because we did see very high prevalence, and especially in the central part of the Canadian Arctic. So you can see right here in the Northwest Territories and in Nunavut, we have animals that are upwards of 80% exposed. Uh, and so we decided that we would do a secondary test on a subsample of these guys just to figure out which particular virus we were looking at. And it turns out that it is Jamestown Canyon virus, that virus that I was talking about that is commonly found in the white-tailed deer. So it's something that we were expecting. But unfortunately with these guys, because they're migratory, it, it really does highlight one complication when it comes to research and trying to associate climate variables with them because they move all the time. So we can't necessarily pinpoint exactly when they're exposed and where they're exposed. But one thing that we could do is we could look at the ecosystems that they use during the summer. So we classified these animals into ecotype and we had migratory tundra caribou, which they have on tundra. Mountain woodland caribou will have their calves in alpine habitat and then boreal woodland caribou will generally have their calves in treed environments. And that's all during the early spring to summer months. And so what we do see is that there's a very high prevalence in boreal woodland caribou and that kind of just decreases as we go up to migratory tundra caribou to 48%. So what we think we're seeing here is an association with the tree line, maybe. Um, also maybe temperature, right? Because as animals are at a lower elevation, we might see higher temperatures than at a higher elevation. So this brings up a whole bunch of questions relating to climate. And it really does emphasize how as these animals are moving and forced to move into different ecosystems, how that's going to impact pathogen transmission. So with the bears, seeing them move more and more on land, but also sea ice loss can also divide um, populations. So for example, Arctic foxes that use the sea ice to move even between continents all the way from Canada to Norway, where I am right now, that could divide them if we lose that sea ice, right? So many things go into what could happen in the future along with this movement of the tree line, we might also see more and more new species moving into the Arctic. We already see that with the uh, Arctic fox and the red fox. And so there's just a bunch of things changing and pathogens are gonna follow in that pattern as well. So I guess I will pass it now to Emily, I think, who's gonna take over. Fantastic. Thanks, folks. Um, I am looking to share my screen. There we go. So you've just heard from three, in my very biased opinion, fantastic young researchers in the Arctic who have been part of this, this broader network. The goals of this One Health approach um, were threefold. And the first one was really monitoring and establishing sentinel sites and host pathogen systems that were likely to change, that were important for Northern residents, and also important scientifically. And in fact, a lot of what we're doing is really just setting baselines, because sometimes very, very little is known about what are, where are we currently at. And we would have to view this um, in a global climate change perspective is already hot baseline. So we're already experiencing warming. So anything that we measure now does not already reflects a displacement from 
pre-climate change. Um, but this first goal actually took uh, probably a decade to really get going to establish these sites and relationships and, um, and systems that we can gather information from. Uh, the next goal was to model, to develop and parameterize epidemiological models that we would then be able to combine with both historical and projected climate data to see what the near future looks like for these diseases in the Arctic. And that remains something that we're still working on. And then the last one, one of the really key pieces about One Health is it's not just um, it's not just an academic exercise. It has to involve some kind of action and change. And um, change isn't necessarily good or bad. It just is. And a lot of what we're doing is documenting change. Uh, but we're also responsible for for doing something about it. <laughs> so one of the things we we really emphasize is capacity building. Um, I, I like to look at the three people you've just heard from as an example of capacity building that these folks are now, um, now have knowledge and experience and contacts and networks that will allow them to go on working in this field of, of One Health. Another is recognizing that we have unique, low resource, low human capacity environments in the Canadian Arctic, which is a vast space. And there isn't a lot of, of diagnostic testing available, although that is changing, and we've been part of that change. Um, and then enabling and engaging citizen scientists, in this case, the very people who are relying on these populations, the hunters and trappers, none of this work could have happened without them. So I was really proud uh, at the Arctic Science Summit Week, most recently in Vienna in February, to see this poster, which highlights the Sinuk projects, the Canadian Inuit Nunangat United Kingdom Arctic Research Program. And one of the projects there that has recently been funded is called Wild Health. Uh, the PI on this is Geraldine Gouin. She is based in Makovic, uh, sorry, at the Nunavik Research Center. Um, which is run by Makovic Inuit Corporation in Kujuak, Nunavik. And one of the really great things in this project is that they had already a trichinella monitoring program, but as a result of this project, they have now been able to add testing for toxoplasma to harvested wildlife. So yet another example of being able to do, the nor do work for the North, in the North, by the North, that really is important for Northern residents. Um, so these are some of the folks involved in my lab group. Um, some work in the Arctic, some don't. And I really just recognize the incredible gift I have to work with these folks. And I would welcome now, I think, to move to some questions from the chat. Oh, one more thing, one very important thing. I asked all my students to give me their acknowledgement slide and I was literally running out of room for logos <laughs> by, by the time I put all this together. This kind of work is tremendously collaborative, um, and we engaged with provincial and territorial governments from across northern Canada. We engaged with four federal government agencies, including the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, which has a, a center for expertise for foodborne parasites right here in Saskatoon. Public Health Agency of Canada, the National Microbiology Lab, has been a key partner in developing some of the testing that we do for uh, particularly for the California serogroup viruses. Um, Polar Knowledge Canada for logistics support and also research funding in the early days of some of this work, um, as well as letting us work out of the Canadian High Arctic Research Station. Environment and Climate Change Canada, key partners um, in some of our Arctic work as well. Um, there is so there is a wide group of funding, including our NSF equivalent or NSERC, uh, is, is and including a special Northern Research Supplement, which, along with the Northern Scientific Training Program, provides uh, travel funding for students to go into the North and work in the North, and then just a tremendous range of of collaborators in the North, including the Makovic Corporation in Nunavik. Several of the students you've seen have been funded by the Weston Family Foundation, which supports doctoral researchers, 10 doctoral researchers per year in Canada to do work in the Arctic and in the North. ArcticNet, Network Centers for Excellence, has been a huge supporter of this work over, over a decade now. Um, and that program is coming to an end, and we're all looking 
with great interest to see what happens with that program going forward. A variety of different academic agencies, Université Montréal, Université Laval, Memorial University, Western College of Veterinary Medicine and University of Saskatchewan. Uh, the polar bear work alone could have an entire slide of acknowledgements, but a key partner there was the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance coming from a conservation perspective. And a very special shout out to the polar bear biologists and students and researchers over the years who collected this very precious archival collection, often at great risk to their own lives and well-being. And none of this could happen without our hunter and trapper partners. And um, I spoke, I know there's going to be questions in the chat, but one that I would throw out to my students would be um, to draw back the veil a little bit on how all these samples came to pass and how much work they put into developing those relationships, reporting back to hunter trapper organizations and engaging them in the work and reporting that the work back to them. So with that, I will stop sharing and just my screen. We'll keep sharing, but not the screen. Back to you, Victoria. Thank you so, so much to all of our amazing presenters. And if everyone could join me in giving a huge virtual round of applause, I know that I was taking lots of notes and learned a tremendous amount, um, both with the arc of how all of this is connected, but really the unique research and added knowledge from each of our presenters. We now have about a half hour for questions. So please either type your question in the chat box or go down to the bottom of your screen and raise your hand if you would like to come on, on the reactions icon again on the bottom of your screen. Uh, to kick us off, we have two questions from Amti. The first is about the absence of domestic cats above the tree line, um, asking if we are sure about that um, and any further insights that you have. The second um, is about um, how high up north do mosquitoes go? So the range of mosquitoes in the subarctic and Arctic. Um, so I'll hand those first two questions over and then we will move on to the next two. Thank you. I'll, I'll get the first one, NT. Um, yeah, maybe absent. Uh, yeah, the absent wouldn't be the, the right word if I said that. It's they're more rare for sure. Uh, but there is cat in the north. Uh, I, I've, I'm aware of cat in Nunavik, northern Quebec. And, but the way the parasite would be transmitted would be if these cats go um, hunt uh, some rodents. That's how they get infected in the south. So if they're outdoor cats. Um, and I think in the north, cats mostly stay indoors for their sake. <laughs> There's a lot of free roaming dogs and uh, other wildlife outside. However, there is the possibility if uh, northern cats eat raw country food, that could may possibly be a way of, for the parasite to sexually reproduce and then shed oocysts. But again, it will depend how the litter is discarded. But but that's definitely something to be looking at maybe eventually in the future because I think more cat might get their way into the north into northern communities as well. Um, so. But but yeah, it, it would have to be outdoor cats or yeah, fit with raw country food that might harbor the parasite. But definitely there's some cats, I agree. <laughs> I guess I can take the second one, the <laughs> mosquito question. But I think it might not be something that I can necessarily completely answer because it is probably very dependent on where we've sampled. So I think everywhere that we have sampled, this would be a question for one of our collaborators, Caroline Villeneuve, who works with mosquitoes. Everywhere that we've sampled has had mosquitoes. So Alaska, all the way to the islands of Nunavut have mosquitoes. I don't know how far people have actually sampled in those islands, but I would hazard a guess that almost everywhere in the Arctic has mosquitoes. It's probably just different depending on whether you're sampling on the coast versus inland. That's from my personal experience. On the coast, you're probably going to get a lot less mosquitoes. 
moving further inland, you're going to get a crazy number. Thank you both for those answers. We have another question from Alex that uh, commends you on a fantastic presentation um, and is wondering if your teams or others are collecting soil samples to also identify microbes or pathogens emerging from the thawing permafrost near these animals. I can probably take that one. Um, we are not personally, but that is a very important area of research interest in the Canadian North. And it would be great to start partnering with folks who are doing that. It's very specialized how, how those soil samples are collected um, and analyzed. There's some pretty interesting findings coming out of thawing permafrost and glaciers microbially right now, uh, including some controversial um, findings where people are actually intentionally resuscitating viruses that they've they've recovered from permafrost cores. And so I think there's a lot of deep questions there that are um, almost getting into the range of ethics rather than science. But um, circling back to the One Health concept, absolutely, that kind of soil environmental microbial ecosystem is, is something we need to know more about and to start putting together the pieces with the animals and plants um, on the land is is a an important linkage that we do need to make. Great, thank you. And I will also put in the chat uh, from a 2020 webinar that the Migration in Harmony Network hosted with Dr. Kimberly Miner, who spoke about the impacts of permafrost degradation. She also spoke to this, so I will share that in the chat. And I know she has had some publications in the past two years related to that. Um, we have another question from Nellie for Kayla um, asking, what was tested for the caribou? Blood, muscles, heart, brain? Yeah, so it was all blood. So it was serum samples when we had access to caribou that were collared. So really nice serum samples. And then from Nunavik, we had hunter harvested samples. So that would be uh, heart blood collected from the heart. Great, thank you so much. Uh, we had a, another question come in that asked about uh, your interdisciplinary approach. Uh, they ask, it seems that you have a lot of collaborators across Western scientific knowledge and indigenous knowledge. Can you speak to how you synthesize these two knowledge systems and how you work across other disciplines. It wasn't directed to anyone, so yeah. <laughs> everyone can jump in. Yeah, um, we don't formally have a social science compete component yet uh, to this network. So we're not doing a lot of the qualitative methodologies that 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 person may be referring to. Um, but, you know, none of this work would happen without very strong Indigenous local knowledge of of their regions, of the animals that are that are important for harvest. Um, one observation that that I've had recently listening to my students defend was um, Inuit hunters really know what a healthy animal looks like <laughs> and they harvest the healthier animals. And so for something like Adrienne's study, where we didn't really find DNA of toxoplasma in these hunter harvested caribou, I think speaks to that immense knowledge there that there's probably selecting the animals that are least likely to have this parasite in their tissues. Um, in contrast, something like Emily's study where we were relying on trapped foxes um, that's more random as to, as to when a fox encounters a trap. And actually, we could argue that a trapped fox um, with toxoplasma is more likely to have risky behaviors. We've actually seen this in other animal systems, that animals with toxoplasma are more likely to take risks. So these animals might be more likely to end up in our traps and give us a bias towards higher prevalence. So um, that's not something we formally 
you know, explored. It's something we recognize as bias, um, but it, it again ties back to knowing, having that local knowledge from our collaborators that gives us a, an appropriate lens to interpret the data. Did any of my students want to jump in on that? Yeah, I guess I did a lot of trip and learning communities at the beginning of my PhD, and that was definitely the crucial part for my project, just to make those connections with the Inuit and also be able to talk science, right? Like with these two different types of knowledges. And, and we did a lot of consultation with hunters, trappers, mayors um, on the radio to explain our project. And we really, to get those two perspectives together was really uh enlightening I don't know if it's the right word but <laughs> uh and like we did hire guides to navigate through the land which we couldn't have done just based on our own scientific knowledge they know they, they knew where uh the dens were they knew where to go specifically so we really relied on them for the specific the specific part of my project just to to know a bit more the fox distribution on the landscape and um so yeah we did bridge both knowledge but as Emily said it was not it was more integrated through the project and more of a not in a direct way it was more indirectly but um but but yeah yeah <laughs> it, it was there somehow and it was very useful for sure and and it, it was critical as well for for my project anyways Yeah, and I think Kayla had an interesting experience um, actually ending up using Facebook and social media platforms. Uh, a community really helped engage with her to find fox dens that she wouldn't have been able to find otherwise. And um, so it's very, it's very important to recognize that these emerging technologies are another way that that things like traditional knowledge are getting shared. Kayla, did you have any comments on that? Um, yeah, I think maybe what it also highlights is just where to know where to report back to communities as well. So like, for example, Facebook was a huge thing in the North to be able to communicate back to people what we were finding. So actually knowing what platforms are effective. I think sometimes as scientists, we focus on publications and don't necessarily focus on anything else. So knowing exactly where to target so that other people that are from those communities will actually see some of the results that that we're getting. Yeah, I agree. Like Facebook for me was some of the only way I could reach some hunters. I that was the only way. And if you didn't know that, it's kind of hard. And and yeah, reporting back is is something also very important for for reporting the science in a way that is easily shared. And for me, it was just posters and, and COVID hit, so we couldn't go in communities. So we had to develop some some means of sharing our, our results with the communities and reporting back. So sending pamphlets and posters uh, translated and in, in it as well. That's very, very important um, because elders, they don't necessarily um, understand very well our English or French, especially. So so that was something I took upon myself just to translate the results a bit in uh, these languages. And we were fortunate enough to be able to do it because it's really expensive. But <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, sharing those knowledge in traditional languages is something definitely important. And Adrienne, you you went um, on community tours in the Nuvialuit settlement region, as well as mo most recently to Kujuak. Uh, any comments on that sharing back piece? Yeah, um, well, yeah, so I, I was in some of the community tours that was for a different project in the Northwest Territories. So that was basically thanks to um, a collaborator from the University of Waterloo. So yeah, it was the, that way I kind of learned the way that how to, to go to the community. So first you go to the elders and then you go to the hunters. And then like you could get feedback and so you have to change everything the way that you are presenting. And then you go to the community and give like a, the same results, but more friendly. Uh, something that also I have kind of learned is that um, 
sometimes you, when you are so involved in science and then you forget to talk like a normal uh, stage and then you have to give the results. So it's like, oh my God, how, how do I go back to communicate these results without giving big words? So that's also a little bit of challenging, but it's possible. And we have done uh, also with other collaborators uh, from the Norwest territories as well, as well with Dunavik, we, we send these uh, little summaries from the rep, uh, results and um, our collaborators just help us to, to send these summaries to the community. Yeah, I know sometimes we've sent our lay summaries and people are like, I'm not sure you really know what lay person actually means. <laughs> so it's always a learning curve, but uh, but it's always very, um, I always end up learning more when I go up to supposedly transmit my knowledge. I end up learning more than I'm sure I'm transmitting back. Um, so it's it's a lifelong process. And I often say that, you know, even toxoplasma alone, I could spend probably several lifetimes researching. Um, Kayla broadened our horizons quite a lot in adding this vector-borne component. So now I need, I think, four lifetimes to, <laughs> to, to really get into this. But it's immensely rewarding to work on things that matter to Northerners, um, which is, I, I think, what we try to do. And I don't know how successful we are at pulling our jargon out when we try and report back. But, you know, we work in a sensitive area. We're finding things in country foods that may be a human health risk. And so walking that line between saying, yeah, there's hazards, there's no zero risk. And yet consuming country foods is really important and critical. And we want you to be able to do that with all the evidence at your fingertips um, and the best possible information. So that's our overarching goal. Amazing. Thank you so much for all of your experiences shared and your insights. Um, I think that was really useful to everyone who works across lots of different research topics uh, on the Zoom. Uh, so I am not seeing any other uh, questions in the chat or hands raised. So I might close us out with one final question, um, piggybacking on what Adrian and Emily just shared about um, sharing research to a wider audience uh, and maybe sidestepping some of that jargon. So One Health as an approach um, is also looked at at different levels from local decision majors, regional, national, global. Could you talk a bit about um, being able to share at those different levels and like Emily just said, work on things that matter um, that hopefully um, are able to create more science informed decision making um, from that local um, level of sharing and maybe co-creating solutions within communities, but also within Canada um, or North America and, and a larger geography, and just talking about that sharing of knowledge. Yeah, um, we do. I mean, we do share our findings with everybody from lay people and hunter trapper associations all the way up to the international arctic science community and to policymakers and there certainly are differences in how how you construct that that sharing of information and yet there are basic principles of good communication good science communication good risk communication um, that really apply across all those different audiences um, so one of the the terms that um, I'm involved in, a, in developing a One Health training grant right now, one of this, the durable skills, we often call them soft skills, but communication is not a soft skill. It's a hard skill. It's hard to learn how to communicate. And so we actually prefer the term durable skills or transferable skills rather than soft skills. But one of the key things we wanna build in both our trainees, but also the general public and policymakers is this concept of bioliteracy. So, being able to, to use biological concepts and understand them in your day-to-day -day life. And for scientists, that's often being able to explain your, your uh, what you do, for example, as I did last week to a grade four class. Um, fortunately, parasites are very fun and very 
<laughs> very tangible and visible and gross. So they they get a lot of traction in the grade four groups. Um, policymakers may be a little less keen on the gross part, <laughs> but but um, I think being able to give a one paragraph or one line or three minute summary of what you're doing and why you're doing it and why it's important is a skill set that I hope my trainees who are now fledging out of the nest um, have developed through the opportunities they've had through training. You guys want to jump in on that? I guess I can quickly just jump in on, yeah, I think that one thing that Emily emphasized with the fourth grade class that I think I learned a lot in my PhD is that change starts at the very young generation. So I was able to be involved as an Earth Rangers ambassador, for example, doing uh, Facebook presentations to elementary school kids and hopefully inspiring some Inuit and Northern youth to get involved in STEM fields. I think that's where major change is gonna happen is more and more people that are from the North are gonna move into these positions of power. And so I think that's very important to remember the younger generations and to involve yourself, especially as a PhD student or even as a PI working with youth. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, if everyone could please again join me in a huge virtual round of applause. Thank you so, so much, Emily, Adrian, Emil, and Kayla for your time, your wisdom, your experiences, and allowing us to join for a brief moment what you are learning um, and engaging in in critical research uh, in the North American Arctic. We will be sharing a recording of this this webinar later today, and we hope that you will join us for future monthly webinars of the Migration and Harmony Research Coordination Network, which you can sign up for in the link in the chat. Thank you again to our presenters, to our guests from around the world, and we hope to see you next month at our next webinar. That's all for today. Have a wonderful May Tuesday. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you, everyone.